Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Chris Williamson. I've been asked to chair this session about municipal socialism uh, this afternoon. Uh, municipal socialism does obviously have a very long uh, pedigree in the Labour Party. And when I first joined the Labour Party 40 odd years ago, uh, there were a lot of local authorities who were dispensing, if you like, municipal uh, socialism. I mean, just up the road from where I live now, where I was born, in, in Derbyshire, the Clay Cross uh, Council, Rural District Council, Urban District Council, I beg your pardon, uh, took on the Heath government over the uh, so-called fair rent rules. And they had you know, some amazing policies, actually. Uh, it wasn't just about low rents. I mean, they were providing free television licenses uh, back in the early 1970s to, to pensioners. They continued when Margaret Thatcher, the milk snatcher, took away the milk from the kids, if I could say that as a vegan, um, they, they found a way of continuing to provide it in an innovative way. And, you know, Derbyshire County Council was another under David Bookbinder, and there were many other examples, Ted Knight in, in Lambeth, um, Great London Council under uh, Ken Livingston and so on. So there's lots of really great examples, but that seems to have dissipated substantially uh, over the, uh, if not <laughs> gone altogether, but it certainly not what it once was in terms of the challenge to uh, the, uh, the status quo. Um, I think under Tony Blair, the new Labour era, they very much sort of hollowed out a local government and took sort of politics out of, out of politics in a way and became, they became very managerial. And I mean, one of the things I've been uh, urging local Labour groups to do when I was uh, uh, and it's still an MP was to for example, introduce a redistributive council tax is now the ability to do that. You don't have to set illegal budgets, but there are ways in which you know the cuts can be can be stopped. Indeed, that's why I stepped down from the front bench uh, back in 2018 over there because the local government front bench were not particularly keen on the proposal. But my concern was that all Labour was offering in local government was that they would manage the Tory cuts better than the Tories will. But we're going to start today's session because we may have heard uh, a lot about or a bit about the the Preston model and uh, I think it's Stuart Rawlinson uh, Mar Mar Martin I know I was going to get it wrong yeah Martin Rawlinson I need to write these names down. Uh, Martin Rawlinson has, has uh, uh, provided a, a video that uh, says a bit about what the Preston model is all about so we're going to watch that first and then uh, I'll ask the speakers to introduce themselves and then we'll, we'll hear from them and then we'll hear from the audience if they have any questions. So can we roll the VT? As they say. Production was very good. Um, it did tell you something about the Preston model and myself. Um, the, the place to start really um, 2008, um, because obviously we had the huge global financial crash, but Preston had, had put all its eggs in one basket, uh, inward investment from um, multinational corporations who had promised for many years to come into Preston and not carpet it down, rebuild it, in a project worth um, 700 million or so. So when that crashed with the with the global financial crash, um, myself and my colleague Matthew Brown decided that we, we needed to do something different, really, than just rely on uh, the super rich coming in and helping us. So. Uh, we decided to meet with um, some economists from a consultancy called the Centre for Local Economic Strategies um, because they've been doing stuff along these lines uh, a little bit with uh, Manchester Council. Um, so uh, no, nothing that we've done really is new, but we've done several things and they've been packaged up and labelled the Preston model, but nothing's, nothing's really new anymore, but it, it's a new context.
started looking at uh, other public sector bodies around us, including ourselves, Preston Council, of course. Uh, we were looking at Preston because Preston has quite a big uh, public sector. Uh, the county council, we have a two tier system here, is, is based in Preston. Uh, we've got a university, a large hospital, housing associations, police, colleges, things like that. We invited them uh, to a couple of seminars, told them what we wanted to do and tried to get them on board. Uh, after that, we started a small group to look at where all these institutions were spending their money. So in total, the, the public sector institutions in Preston have got at least a billion pounds a year to spend. That's a huge amount of money and a huge amount of influence on the local economy if they decide to spend it there. Uh, Preston itself, Preston Council, which is a fairly small council in reality, was only spending 14% of its uh, spending on goods and services actually in Preston. So we started studying where they were spending it and then trying to encourage each other to spend more in the locality and also encourage local suppliers to tender for our contracts more. In a period of two years, we increased um, Preston Council spending in Preston to 28%. We doubled it. The, all the anchors put together increased their spending uh, in Preston in this two-year period by £70 million. And in the same two-year period in, in Lancashire um, by £200 million. So these are not uh, insignificant sums. Uh, major sums of money going into the local economy, jobs, the supply chain that would have gone elsewhere. Now, a bit further down the line, the uh, Centre for Local Economic Strategies had a look at perhaps who was missing out because we'd started to get noticed at this point, started to get criticism that this is just protectionism that we're just cutting other people out of the chain. But uh, when they had a look at uh, those that were missing out, it's likely to be the wealthy Southeast and uh, global shareholders, in fact, are losing out, who are already very wealthy. So we, we dispute that point. Plus the world is all is extremely complicated. There's, there's, there's billions of transactions every day across borders. So, we can't create a little bubble and just act on our own. So these these claims that we're just creating a, uh, a protectionist uh, city is just nonsense. So we also looked at a place in Spain called uh, Mondragon, which is in the Basque region of Spain, which has been growing worker co-ops for, I think it's about 70, 80 years since the... Um, Spanish Civil War, in fact, in the 1930s. And the Basque region was terribly neglected at that time. Um, and uh, a local priest decided that they could uh, protect themselves from um, the government, from the state, um, who were neglecting them by uh, creating worker cooperatives. And they started to do that. And now they've got a hundred and they've got a large umbrella organization called the Mondragon Corporation, uh, which, which looks after all the co-ops. They have a bank, they have their own bank, which trades on the international stage, but it's, it's a local bank for them. And it's, uh, it's set up so that it's virtually impossible to be taken over by a bigger bank because it's one member, one vote. And they have a university and they have a welfare system and they have a, a social side to it. It's, it's a whole place uh, system. And um, they were protected to a very large extent from the global crash of 2008. It affects them uh, a little bit. It affected the uh, welfare system. Uh, they realized they needed to put a bit more money into that afterwards. A couple of co-ops got into trouble, but a lot of the workers were taken on by the other co-ops. So uh, they fared much better than areas that didn't have the co-op. So we wanted to try and recreate that. Very difficult, of course. They've been at it for 70, 80 years, and um, they've got 100 co-ops, but we wanted to start doing that. So 
we started uh, a body called the Preston Cooperative Development Network, which is separate from the council, which is a lot of interested parties, which um, sits and uh, offers advice and encourages local businesses, uh, local individuals to start co-ops in Preston. Uh, we've already got a worker co-op cafe. We've got a, a digital co-op, uh, one or two other things, but in the last 12 months or so, we've won some funding from the Soros um, Foundation and we've got the money to encourage more co-ops for another 10 co-ops. We've got um, some local taxi drivers interested in getting together and starting a co-op and there's, there's several other things too. So um, that's really starting to kick off now. Something else that we wanted to recreate from Mondragon was um, the bank. So uh, we're not the only ones wanting to start a bank. In fact, we I think we probably talked about it um, first, but um, some other areas may have overtaken us a little bit on this and um, been a bit quicker at it, but we're getting there. We've, we've set the company up. Uh, it's registered with the financial authority or whoever it has to be, the Bank of England or whatever it is. And we've got partners, we've got um, capital to put into it. It needs, you know, X amount of capital to start, maybe 20 million. And uh, the bank is going to exist to support the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises that really struggle to get loans from the high street banks, and they really do. And also, obviously, to support the co-op sector, which we're trying to create. Here. It will also be uh, a day-to-day -day trading bank. It, it should have high street uh, branches, even if they are electronic branches, in fact. Um, but that's, that's what we're aiming at in the next uh, year or two. Uh, we're hoping, we're, we're aiming for about 3% of the market share in um, three years to make it viable. Um, so that's quite a big project. Another thing we looked at to um, support the local economy, the Lancashire Pension Fund is a huge pot of money, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds. We, uh, we have a, a seat on the board, or, but only one seat, so we can't control the thing. We can't tell them what to do. We can only encourage, but they have started investing more uh, locally. They've built some student accommodation. They're investing in a new hotel and all that's worth tens of millions of pounds, which wasn't happening before. Um, our own investments, Preston Council, we, we had an old uh, market hall. We knocked it down, we recreated it under a Victorian canopies. Uh, it's full of local traders. It's wholly owned by the council. Uh, it washes its face and it, and it should uh, grow. And right next to it, we want to build a uh, multiplex type cinema with bowling alley and car park on the site of the old market, uh, costing around 35 million pounds, wholly funded by council money. So uh, any profits from that uh, will come back to the council. It will be wholly owned by the council once we've paid the developer back. Other ideas that we've we've uh, had are credit union. Uh, our credit union went bust uh, many years ago. We brought another one into the area, so that's building up to. We support a local development finance initiative that lends money to people who who are uh, financially excluded. Uh, we, we've kept all our voluntary sector grants when most councils have cut them. Uh, we have our own advice services, people too. We started a food co-op for a while. We did um, energy purchasing, collective energy purchasing to help save people money. Uh, we did try and start a wind farm, an energy co-op, uh, but we're blocked on planning grounds, unfortunately. But we're constantly looking at how we can um, improve you know, uh, fuel poverty. So we, we haven't done um, the, everything. There's lots of other towns and cities doing stuff along the same lines. 
there is local currencies which we've never tried um as i said we're not that big we can't do everything uh municipal bonds which are kicking off now which look really interesting mutual credit which is a way of trading uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises between themselves without money uh, which cuts the banks out again high street banks who you know control everything really and there are councils now around the country, <clears throat> along with ourselves, trying to look at whole place community wealth building. So we're looking for a for a strategy that covers everything, really. Um, you know, the, the fuel poverty, the food poverty, um, the, the banking, undercutting the banking system, um, the, the, the whole thing, when it, a whole encompassing strategy uh, so that we're not reliant on inward investment. Uh, Preston Council, over the last few years, while we've been pursuing this, we haven't stopped looking for inward investment. And any money that rolls by from the government, we, we grab it. Um, we're not daft, but uh, at the same time, uh, we know that it's not sustainable because these things are at the will of the existing government and at the will of developers and investors. Um, whereas if if you're more sustainable locally, if you have worker co-ops, that money stays in the local economy for longer. Uh, the longer it's in local pockets, the better off the area is. Less of the money leaks out to shareholders across the globe and they decide whether the money comes back or not. Whereas if it stays here, we decide uh, where it goes. And that's, that's really the, the crux of community wealth building. Thanks. Great. Am I on? Hello? Still not on. Right. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I, is my microphone working? It is good. It doesn't feel like it is. Oh, it is now. It wasn't then, actually. Just like projecting my voice, you see. Um, yeah, well, we'll just get the panel's thoughts, I think, on the uh, Preston model and why other local authorities or more local authorities aren't, aren't doing that. We have a very impressive lineup of, of lifelong socialists, uh, Roger Silverman, a lifelong socialist who is under threat of auto exclusion. Uh, Carell uh, Buxton is the chair of uh, West Ham CLP, which is the suspended CLP, and Greg Hadfield is been suspended about three times now. Three times, auto excluded, but still a visit to the Labour conference. There we go, you see. So. <laughs> and um, and of course, I, and of course, I was uh, suspended and then readmitted and then suspended again and then left. So you have, uh, yeah, curious, uh, curious panel. Um, in that sense, um, who wants to start? Well, perhaps what I'll do as well, actually, because I'm not giving a very full introduction now. I'll ask each of the speakers to give us a little bit of a potted history, uh, other than they are lifelong socialists who have been suspended by the Labour Party. It seems to be, uh, it seems to be the, the way these days, if you're a socialist, and particularly if you're a lifelong socialist, you're going to get suspended from the Labour Party. But uh, Greg, start with you. Just give us a bit of a potted history for the people watching. I'm pointing to Roger and Carol, actually, because I'm, I'm the weak link on the panel. Uh, I've never been a councillor. I stood, I joined the Labour Party in 2006 when I uh, ended my career as a journalist. And I stood in a no hope seat against the Greens, deliberately just across the road. I wasn't really in favor. I wasn't part of the machine, so I didn't get one of the sweet spots. Um, but having spent 20, 30 years watching local government on regional and local newspapers, I spent more time than any human being should do in the, the council chamber. And living in a city as great as Brighton and Hove, I'm really interested in cities and unitary authorities. But I spend a lot of time asking myself some questions about what we mean and why we're in local government whilst recognizing I have the, the luxury of never having been a councillor, never having been a can candidate, never having won an election. Well, I won an election. I won an election as the secretary of Brighton and Hove uh, City Party, and four days later, the City Party was suspended, and then two months later, I was suspended, and then et cetera. So, and Labour's interested in winning elections. Well, I think we do need to win elections, and I think it's great the work that Roger and Carol are doing. 
and they should be taking the floor, though, Jim. Oh, no, indeed. Well, it was only just to kind of get a brief uh, introduction, and and certainly you're right. I mean, I spent a lot of time in council chambers as well. I was chair, I was leader of the council. That was the, the best thing, the most enjoyable thing, most rewarding thing, the most effective thing I've ever been able to do, really, because you really are able, you're a big fish in a little pond, you're able to, to make a difference, even in these very difficult and, and troubled times. But, uh, Carol, give us a bit more information about you. Okay, well, I am not personally suspended or auto excluded so they haven't got round to me yet so maybe by the end of this session <laughs> um sitting with me, so. yeah sitting <laughs> actually chris um there was a, a photograph taken by uh, some of our comrades who met with you in um in a i think in the hotel lobby and um, a couple of years ago at conference and there were a lot of nasty comments and I was very proud to be sitting with you and I made sure that everybody in the CLP knew that. Um, so I joined the Labour Party in 1973 um, and I was very active in the Labour Party Young Socialists. Um, I've never been a councillor. Um, I did try uh, in 2018 but they didn't want me obviously because I am a fervent socialist and I am quite good at campaigning and that really worries them. I was a head teacher for 25 years, so I'm fairly good at organizing as anybody who's been a primary school teacher has to be. So that really terrified them. So I left the Labour Party uh, over the Iraq war and I rejoined uh, when Ed Miliband actually became the leader because I was so incensed about the bacon sandwich racism that I thought someone's got to stand up for um, good people like him in the Labour Party. So I joined, rejoined. And then, of course, Corbyn was elected and it was like a big shock. And I think when I was watching the election on the TV, I was, because I'm, um, you know, I was almost in tears because it was so moving and so wonderful. So now I feel those hopes have been dashed. So I think what I'm going to talk about a bit later is what we're trying to do in uh, Newham, in the heart of the East End of London. So I'm going to hand over to Roger now. Well, well comrades, <clears throat> I've never been an off I've never been a councillor or a candidate, or I think even an officer of the party at all. The only thing I've ever been is just once I was delegate to conference, that's two years ago. And I think that's uh, not gonna happen again, <laughs> the way things are. <laughs> so that's my career. <laughs> um, now, I want to refer to it. I hope, I hope you don't think I'm digressing too much, but I think this relates very much to a point that a comrade made this morning when he said, why aren't the left fighting back? And um, we have to ask about that because when Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, it was the biggest political party in Europe. I think the biggest political party in Europe now is the ex-Labour Party. It's uh, the people who, um, who either been kicked out, suspended or have left in disgust. So those people are still there. The, we have about 300,000 comrades in this country. Why can't we all just get together and form a mass party? We're, we'll be a far bigger party than Keir Starmer's party. So that is really the, the key to the whole thing. Now, I must say, I mean, we all love Jeremy and uh, we are really happy to be, um, you know, to, to have comrades in Parliament who are loyal to uh, to at least the vaguely to socialist ideas and so on. That's the mo you know, that's something we have to hold on to. But the question is, they are not fighting back. And we see the results of this this week. And um, why is that? Now, I, th I think what has happened is a tradition of the left going back for decades to say, well, you know, we need to have a broad front. It's a broad church. And so we'll you know, broad churches are fine. They shouldn't include the devil. And uh, that, that's a bit too broad, OK? <laughs> and I think there's another thing that, I mean, Tony Benn used to say, and of course, he's uh, an icon, but Tony Benn used to say, 
no bird can fly with only one wing. It needs two wings. I would say to that, that's absolutely true. But if the two wings are flying in opposite directions, what you get is a split. <laughs> and that's what we need to learn. Now, I think, why does this tradition go back? Because up until 1994, there was some justification for it because the idea was there that, I mean, labor was at least uh, in principle or on paper, a socialist party. Every member had printed on their membership card clause four, which is a very good definition of what we all want. Common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, and the best obtainable system of democratic control of it. Now that's fine, that's what we all want. The very, very first thing that Tony Blair did when he was elected leader was to call a special conference in order to scrap Clause 4. Now, that was not just a um, formality. People at the time said, oh, well, I mean, so what? It's only a piece of paper. It's a very, very important piece of paper because what it was was a guarantee to the ruling class that we are no longer talking even in, you know, in pious... Um, uh generalities about building a new society we're not we are safe you can trust us and new labor won power on that basis it for the first time in history the tory party was starved of funds all big business donations were going to new labor the rupert murdoch press who previously had boasted when the tories won it was the sun what won it well it was the sun what won it for tony blair in 1994 and subsequently and they only dispensed with Blair and New Labour when the crash came and they uh, and they had to move to a different tack of harsh austerity measures and so on so that's the point things changed in 1994 up until that time Labour leaders always used to justify themselves by saying well we have to go slowly we can't do it all at once bit by bit we're getting there and that had some kind of plausibility at the time because of the, you know, the memory of the 1945 government when they did nationalise um, uh, things. And even in the 64 government, one or two things again were nationalised. But, um, but after that, it was privatisation all the way. And therefore, things have changed. You know, the, you could no, it's no longer a question of you know, well, we can't do it all at once and so on. It's, it's now a complete break. Now, therefore, that's why I think the cutoff point, that's where, let's put it plainly, there should have been a split in 1994. There wasn't because you still had the boom and so on, but since the 2007, eight crash, and particularly now when, I mean, that crash will seem like nothing to the catastrophe that's coming now. Britain is a failed state almost now. You look at your know, gas prices, you look at the petrol uh, shortages, food shortages, uh, the, the um, cuts in credit, the uh, rises in taxes. I mean, it's, it, this, this is, we're going to see all kinds of hell break loose. And I'm afraid it's, we can't go on sort of sheltering in Keir Starmer's party thinking, well, maybe one day we'll get another Corbyn elected. That's not the way. We have to, you know, we have to move. Now, I'm not saying we should break away and form a separate party just like that, with a snap of the fingers. We've got too many separate parties already, if you like, of a couple of hundred here and there. What we want is a mass party of hundreds of thousands, and we can get it, but we have to mobilize. We have to wait, find some way to do it. So that's a long preamble, if you like, to what, um, what Carell is going to explain about Newham, because um, just, to, just to kind of finish the train of thought, in, in uh, Newham, now Newham has traditions, it's 100% Labour Council, it's got two Labour MPs, one of which has the highest majority, I think, in, in Parliament. Uh, it's got a directly elected mayor, though we were against that system. So it's solid 100% Labour, 1000% Labour, if you like. Um, and um, the party in February, without warning, without explanation, nothing. They just shut us down, suspended the two CLPs. Uh, we'd already kind of had an inkling. Well, you know, something has got to happen. Maybe they'll expel Corel. Maybe they'll expel me and other, other comrades and so on. What do we do then? Well, we're ready. We're, we've got two choices. 
we can go home and give up politics. Well, you know, I don't think that's a very attractive proposition. I don't think anybody who knows us would want us to do that or expect us. So we formed Newham Socialist Labour and we carried on with all the campaigning work that we're doing, which Corel, I mean, I have to say Corel is the powerhouse behind this. Corel is the one who does astounding amounts of work day and night. So I, um, I don't want to do anything to try and uh, steal her glory. Corel, you explain from now on, okay? Well, yeah, no, just very briefly then, I mean, in relation to your point about mass party, totally uh, with you on that, uh, Roger, and uh, what I would recommend there, and a little advert for the Festival of Resistance on the 16th and 17th of October in Nottingham, when that will be one of the things that we will be discussing. And if we do go down that road, then I think we absolutely have to find a way of working and uniting with people on the left, you know, work together with socialists on the left. It's what's kind of killed the left, I think, over the years. And let's remember the British Empire ruled over the most probably successful empire the world has ever known, and is past masters at divide and rule. And, and there will certainly be infiltration and, and they will certainly be, you know, trying to uh, ensure that there are those uh, divisions and they'll be they'll be accentuating uh, them. And we need to uh, obviously be you know mindful of that. And just on your point, uh, Corral, about when Jeremy got elected, it absolutely was a wonderful moment. I was outside the QE2 uh, um, conference center and literally uh, it was it was in Martha Reeves and the Vandellas that sang about dancing in the street. They were dancing in the street. We really were. It was unbelievable. What a moment. And, uh, you know, we've got to somehow recapture that. Those people, like you say, Rob, they're not going away. They have not disappeared into the ether. And you've got to find a way of mobilizing people. It's no good having lots of little kind of, but we've got to find a way of, of mobilizing uh, people. We've just heard about the about the, uh, the Preston model and why more local authorities are doing that. There are things that can be done at a local level through your local authority that can make a real difference. And we need to ensure that we don't let just like the people in Westminster, but we don't have our local councillors either. Get away with giving us bullshit. There are things at their disposal, me me you know, mechanisms at their disposal to make a real difference on the ground. And it's fantastic that we've got people like Roger and, and Carell here to talk about what they're doing, because that's the sort of thing I think that we need to uh, replicate up and down the country. So inspire us, Carell, and then we'll hear obviously from, from, from Greg as well, because let's remember that this guy led the biggest constituency Labour Party in the country, and for his troubles, it got kicked out. I mean, what a disgrace. But anyway, Carell, over to you. Thanks. So um, what I'm gonna do is just say something about the video, because, I mean, there's some really, really good things in that, things that I'd never thought of. I mean, the idea of setting up a, a bank is just, you know, beyond belief. I don't know how you do that, but um, I was inspired by quite a lot of the things that Martin Rawlinson was talking about in Preston. And um, I applaud that council for what they're doing. Um, you know, and I hope it's replicated around the country. Now in Newham, as Roger has outlined, we have a solid Labour council. Remember um, the first Labour MP came from West Ham. That was Keir Hardy in 1902. He was elected as the Labour MP for, for, for West Ham. And um, if you look at the banner just behind us to the right, you will see we're calling for the Labour Party to reinstate West Ham and East Ham, five and a half thousand members who were um, disenfranchised. Oh, is it fallen down? Yeah. The last time I spoke at something, we had a big picture of Keir, of, um, Keir Starmer and it fell down. I think I must have that effect on people. Anyway, um, so Newham Council have done some, some good stuff. I mean, they have brought in the London living wage. They've got £107 million from um, Sadiq Khan for house building. And they did stop the toxic loans that we, the council had to NatWest. And I think that saved um, Newham about 140 plus million pounds. So they have done some good things. Although actually living in Newham for 30 plus years, it feels as though things are getting worse. Things are deteriorating on the ground. And um, I've lived in the same house for 25 years. And if I just say to you, when I walk around the streets and uh, people know me and talk to me and then I go in the shops and they know I'm, the ch I'm in the Labour Party, they give me a really hard time about things that matter to local people, like the state of the roads, 
um, litter, uh, the fact that you can't have bulky waste removed unless you pay 20 plus pounds to the council. Um, Newham's got a slogan which says people at the heart of everything we do. And I think there's um, a lot of people in Newham who don't feel that that is the case. So we've been very underfunded as all councils have. We faced austerity. Um, we've got the highest number of people on the housing waiting list, 28,000 plus individuals on the housing waiting list. We've got overcrowding, we've got cladding on buildings, we've got the highest rate of air pollution in the country and that really impacts on our children's health. 96 people die every year, around 96 people die um, because of air pollution in the borough. I mean, it's a really, really serious thing. So we can look at all the glossy brochures on the council website about community wealth building, and you wouldn't disagree with anything that's there. But on the ground at the grassroots, ordinary people are really suffering. And I just want to say a couple of things um, are that, that are campaigns that are going on in the borough. I mean, I could think of 15 campaigns that local people have organized. Um, the, the Madison Square Garden Sphere in Stratford, which is going to be as tall as Big Ben, right in the middle of a residential area. It's appalling. The Silvertown Tunnel, which is um, like the Blackwall Tunnel going under the water at Royal Docks, which is one of the really rough parts of, of Newham in, around Canning Town and Custom House. Lots of schools around there are going to be impacted by an increase in pollution. This is going to be for HGV lobbies, if they can get any drivers to drive them, of course. Um, but the really serious things like that, the fact that we have got thousands and thousands of homes being built in blocks, luxury blocks that ordinary people can't see, can't afford. They look at them and they're empty. There's somebody in the concierge turning the lights on and off. And they're owned by in investors that are just keeping them empty because they know they do nothing with them and don't have the problem of tenants moving in, making demands upon them as landlords, that that, that property will go up anyway. So there's massive, massive issues. I don't know if Preston and other councils are facing them, those issues. I can only talk about what I understand and what I know about in my location. And I think the council are well aware of those issues, but they've been starved of resources and actually in some cases are not helping local people. So for example, the closure of the um, Stratford Arts Centre with a loss of 300,000 pounds of arts council grant on an annual basis is really just incompetence. Uh, uh, I think the thing that really lo locally got people going was the fact that they're closing the city farm because people could take their kids there fairly cheaply um, and see, you know, the little animals and people are really, really fed up. They can see public spaces being put in the hands of private developers. Now, when we were suspended um, the beginning of this year, we weren't suspended because we passed a resolution criticizing David Evans. You know, they, they threatened us, but it wasn't that. It's because they don't want us to be councillors. They want to choose their own councillors. They don't want us to stand for the mayor uh, under a Labour Party ticket, and they didn't want us to be here at conference. That's what it's about. It's about keeping us quiet. So as Roger said, we could have just gone home and given it all up, but we didn't want to do that. We couldn't do it. We decided we had to rebuild and we got to continue the fight. Remember, George Lansbury in the 1920s led the Poplar Eight Revolt. And people in Newham, like myself, know that history of our area and know the fight of the suffragettes like Sylvia Pankhurst and, and the Dockers who spoke in um, what is now a, a disused, beautiful 
council building, the old Canning Town Library, they actually spoke there, and that is just falling into, into disuse and falling into abeyance. So we had individual members leaving the Labour Party in West Ham and East Ham. We had individuals suspended um, and people just despairing. So we decided we'd set up Newham Socialist Labour for those people who were still in the Labour Party and those people who then had been pushed out. So what do we do? What is Newham Socialist Labour? Well, we're a small group. We meet regularly. We have reports and we have political education, just like the Labour Party. We have a few officers, but it's quite informal. We've developed policy statements on housing, health and education. And one of our main strands is solidarity, not charity. We're absolutely embedded in our community. Um, we're grassroots activists. We campaign, we leaflet, we demonstrate, and we're involved in a whole range of campaigns around the health service and privatization, the academization of schools, which we totally oppose, and we've had quite a lot of success with Unfortunately, the Labour Council are continuing the privatisation of schools by the back door um, in Newham. Um, and they've got, we've, part, we've got a policy against academisation of schools, but the council are choosing not to implement it. And the academisation is going ahead in a covert way. And it's a, it's a disgrace. Um, we're involved against developers, and we support local, local campaign groups. But on top of that, we run a school uniform shop every summer because uniforms really, really expensive for families, particularly for mums who worry about it. So we um, recycle school uniform. We've got um, a dry cleaner who cleans all the blazers and everything for nothing. And we distribute it. So we have, that's quite a big thing that we do. We also are involved in supporting food banks um, and running food banks. So one of our comrades is involved with the food bank that feeds up to 300 to 400 people every Saturday. I mean, it's massive. Um, but all of these little campaigns, they're quite small little groups and we know we've got to start joining up. So we've planned a meeting to set up a united front a strategy to go forward, to link everyone together, and it's involved with the Trades Council. Of course, all of us are active trade unionists in the NEU, which is not affiliated to the Labour Party, um, in Unite, in TSSA, in Unison, etc. And we've drawn our inspiration from the Panthers in America. I don't know if any of you have heard of Fred Hampton in the Chicago chapter of the, of the Panthers, uh, Fred, there's a film about him, which I haven't seen yet, um, that's just come out and um, it's called uh, Judas and the Black Messiah because he was betrayed, of course, as often we are on the left. Um, the difference there between here and there is that at the age of 21, he was murdered by the FBI. Um, he said, black power, power to black people, white power, power to white people, yellow power, power to yellow people, all power to the working class. So a slightly different emphasis than the Panthers on the other coast uh, in, in Oakland, California. He worked with the Latino young, young lords and the white hillbilly young patriots. Um, so they, they would have these meetings where these young patriots, white guys would turn up with insignia of Confederate flags. They had the first inaugural meeting in, in Oakland in 1969. And um, they started off what was one of the biggest movements of people power, ordinary working people in the United States. And it lasted a couple of years. We're trying to replicate that in our borough. We want to set up uh, library services, tu free tuition for children, play facilities, we've got big plans, we haven't got any money, <laughs> we've got big plans, well, we're attracting people towards our cause. So yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> Take over the world tomorrow.
No, that's great. Thanks very much indeed uh, for that, uh, Corral. And uh, Fred Hampton, I mean, a great role model. I mean, there's a wonderful quote from him. He said, you don't fight. People say, talk about fighting fire with fire. So you don't fight fire with fire. You fight fire with water. It's like you don't fight black uh, um, racism. Uh, sorry, you don't fight racism with black racism. You fight uh, uh, racism with solidarity. You don't fight capitalism with black capitalism. You fight it with socialism. And uh, he was just an inspired uh, uh, guy and at 21 years of age. I mean, what an amazing uh, figure he was and what he could have gone on to achieve. But that, I mean, the, the Panthers are a fantastic role model. It's great what you're doing, uh, Corel, in, in your uh, neck of the woods there in Newham. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, your example will, will inspire others. And if we can kind of hook up, as it were, I mean, hook up within your borough, but then hook up from borough to borough. And uh, that's what we are hoping to do. And one of the things we're going to be discussing at the Festival of Resistance, to give that another plug on the 16th and 17th. So if you're free to come to Nottingham to talk about some of this stuff, because we'll also be discussing, you know, your point, Roger, about, well, is this the time to start the process for registering a, a new political party? Or do we just continue to focus on the movement? You can't have one without the other, in my opinion. You desperately need a movement. In my opinion, a movement's more important than a party. Because if we put all our faith in leaders, we know they're always, they're always going to let you down. But, Roger, do you want to just sort of add anything to uh, what Corella's just said? Or you'll just put your particular um, uh, sort of spin on, on, on the whole... All, OK. Honest. Well, let me move on then to, to, to Greg, and then, then then we'll perhaps see if the people in the audience have got any comments or queries that they want to, to raise. Greg, give us your thoughts and observations of local government over the years. I, I grew up in Barnsley, mining town in the Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire. Um, and in the last millennium, it was a different world. It was a different Labour Party. It was a different set of values that people em um, employed. And certainly what it was, was one P bus fares. It was council managed, council run bus services. Um, it was local authority uh, mortgages, actually. There were friends of mine, neighbors of mine who had local authority mortgages in Barnsley Town Hall that got them on the ladder. Never been talked about as far as I know since. And there are real restrictions. So I spent 20, 30 years as a journalist in Wakefield, nearly the Socialist Republic of West Yorkshire at the time I was there. And then in uh, Plymouth, in Exeter, in Truro, all spending far too many hours watching, often Labour Party, but sometimes Tory councillors discussing. Now we know and in Brighton. And we know that most councillors spend most of the time talking rubbish. Rubbish and parking. Yeah, they're the two things, right? But usually rubbish. And I've spent many an hour wondering, what's the point of local government? And so I actually joined the Labour Party because of the Iraq war. I thought never again will that party that represents my class go to war like that ever again. You know, we've started bombing Libya about 11, you know, 12 months later, but you know, um, and it's not stopped. But it's really important. I think it's important to stop the Labour Party doing what it wants to do. And we are part of that if you're allowed to cling on, cling on, despite suspension, et cetera, et cetera. But Chris is right, it's about a movement. So what, what's the point of local government? What's the point? Why did I stand in 2006 as a new, newly joined Labour Party member in a no hope ward just across the road, thousand majority to the Greens. And the reason was because it's part of democracy. The point of local government is to reach out and engage and embrace and bring in citizens. And that's what we did in the Brighton Hove City Party, thanks to Jeremy Corbyn. The right, and this is the first nine years of my time in the Labour Party, no one objected to me in those nine years because I lost every vote, yeah? I lost every motion. I stood for chair and got 23 votes out of 100 people. Yeah. And most of those 100 people had never turned up for a meeting in the previous year. They just turned up for the AGM because there's a secret communication network that gets them out. And then when we built up under Jeremy's leadership, when we had 800 people in the Brighton Centre, when we had 600 people in City College in 2016 after the Chicken Co, when we had 6,200 members, one in 25 adults in this city were members of the Labour Party. There was one of our members in every street. There was one of our members in every schoolyard. There's one of our members, at least in every factory, in every shop. It, and it was brilliant. We were beginning to do something for four days. We were suspended. 
But that gave me a vision of what you should do. So what we did when we were suspended and we were told to split into three different CLPs and we were told to have a delegate structure and we were then told that, that, that there would be a steering committee that chose that they would all choose the candidates. Because the history in Brighton and Hove is there are 15 winnable seats. This is 2010 before. Run by the right. They're not interested in how many people stand. But guess what? The 15 people who put their names forward, all in the gang, yeah, the clique, were placed in the 15 winnable seats. Yeah, fancy that. When we, as the momentum at the time and Corbyn, pro Corbyn leadership team, all 10 of us, I got 66%, everybody got more than 63% of 600 votes for four days. We then fought back and we took control of the CLPs and we took control of the selection of candidates. Because let's be honest, the, the, the right people, the correct people, the socialist people do not come forward in their proper numbers to stand for council. And it's understandable why not, because no one ever tells them, invites them, trains them, enthuses them, inspires them. But we did. We got nearly 100 people putting their names forward, often for the wards in which they lived. Fancy that. Yeah. We have a middle class ward in Brighton that has, at the last count I did, the election before last, I think, 60% of all candidates of all parties came from this one middle class ward in Brighton. I, I have a Labour, I had a Labour colleague in my ward, Patcham, who stood for 10, who was a councillor for 10, 15, 20 years in Mulscombe and Bevendy, the biggest Labour stronghold, definitely our stronghold territory, should be represented by good socialists. And during this process, after we reinvigorated the three CLPs, led by pro Corbyn leadership teams, we had people competing to be in that ward. And this Councillor Anne Meadows didn't get selected. She joined the Tories. She stood in Patcham, her own ward, and won that seat as a Tory. And of course, part of her campaign was selfies on the doorstep, on the Tory, they don't do that, do they? We do that, on the Labour doorstep. And most of the selfies were her picking up litter because obviously that's what Anne Meadows does, talks rubbish all the time. What I'm saying is that democracy is multi-layered. And if we can't give an example as a party or as a, a movement, and if we can't embrace 6,200 people, 10,000 people and open it up and really work hard to get some representation. I used to run a local newspaper and I printed the headshots of all the councillors as they announced that they sought diversity, yeah? All the white, middle-aged, largely men. We actually were quite good on gender balance and pride, to be fair, we are. But what we did as a pro Corbyn team, and I was suspended, so I wasn't formerly part of the team, but I, was, I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, we did get a much more representative and some of them got elected. We got a good result, whatever the right wing say, and they're probably saying it now, literally now, because they're watching, um, is, is that, um, oh, they're all cranks, extremists, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we lost these seats to the Greens, whatever. But we got in some good working class socialist members in good, working class wards that need council help and support and one of the reasons that motivated me the most after my failed attempt to be the honorable councillor for st peter's north lane in 2006 was think about what councils can do think about what councils should do now there are big differences chris's first meeting in brighton february 2017 was about restructuring and rethinking the regressive tax that's council tax Definitely a big discussion. I seem to remember a manifesto. I don't read manifestos, certainly not national ones, but I seem to remember we had a manifesto commission uh, uh, commitment in the Labour Party to set up a commission to think about local government funding and the council tax. That commission never met, was never appointed, never reported, no one ever discusses it, etc. Except we know what's an election winner. Restrict council tax increases to 1.99% unless George Osborne says you can do it to 3.99%. Yeah. 
Meanwhile, a Labour council in this city increased council tax for some people by 176% in one year. How? They got rid largely of the council tax reduction scheme support. So the, poor, the 14,000 poorest households in our city suddenly faced what for them was a huge increase in council tax. It's not a huge increase of council tax for me, you know, in my house, it's not. And I argued that whatever happens, that should be one commitment. We never diminish the support from the council tax reduction scheme because it leads to problems elsewhere. It's a terribly minor thing. And then that led me, led me on to think, so what should a council do? Well, I think it should have unremitting defense of various groups. And I won't list them all because I'll forget some, but I'll just talk personally. Children with special needs, absolutely protected, red line protected, yeah? Absolutely. Obviously, homeless people and making sure they've got a proper roof over there. Not by paying landlords 200 and odd quid a week. I won't go into the scam that went on in Brighton, but I did write about it. Um, uh, benefiting from that. Um, we've got to do, I, we can't do much about buses and things like that, but we can do more than we do. But essentially there's a big democratic argument that the role of local authorities, and I think more cities, has got to work with workers, citizens, communities to become more democratic and listen to them. Not to think just because we've got the power for the next four years, because we have an all, we have an all our council every four years. And that everything we see, because we've got the hammer of policy, everything we see is a nail, you know? Oh, there's a problem. We're new best, we're gonna hammer it, we're gonna solve it. Because some of my friends who became councillors, they're good people, yeah? I used to see them, talk to them almost every day, every week, when we were selecting them, when we were electing them. And then suddenly they go into the black hole of the Labour group, which has its own problems. And I'm not saying you never hear of them. I see lots of photographs of them on Twitter. I see lots of photographs of them on social media. I haven't seen a single one in a single political meeting in the last three years, I think. Now, obviously, that's partly because of leprosy and social pariahdom. But the fact is, they don't engage. And, the, and under that delegate structure, how many people turn up to GC meetings? 30, 40, even on Zoom, yeah? We had 600 and odd people, yeah? At one meeting in one afternoon in three sessions. I don't even know how many members we've got because they're no doubt defaulting like mad or being kicked out like mad. It's, it's countless. It really is countless how many people, and we should count them, but they don't care. That's not democracy. It's a centralized control over the foot soldiers, the leaflet fodder, and over policy. And the whole goal of it is to stifle the voice of socialism and socialists who actually want to raise the issues. There is no answer. You know, I don't have the answer. Thank God I'm not a counselor and I'm told I never will be. Um, but it's difficult and the answer comes from opening up discussion and debate and listening, listening and learning and accepting there will be moments when you can do what you can do and you must push to do what you're not allowed to do. And when you push and you push hard, you push with an army of members behind you and an army of citizens behind you. So you think about how to be, what's the role of local government? Why do we encourage people to stand and there are opportunities to spread the message. And we accept that the election on May the 4th or whatever is not the end of a campaign. It's the beginning of a campaign. It's the beginning of don't spend your time in the licensing subcommittee on the Thursday afternoon to talk about the pin of a head for two hours, which nobody knows about and fewer people care. Get out into the membership first. Let's have a Labour group that's led by someone voted for by Labour Party members. How ridiculous is that? Yeah. Rather than settling a, a factional squabble within the Labour group, as in Brian, by having one good um, co-leader and then having somebody who, in my view, shouldn't even be in the Labour Party. 
but then that's her view about me. So, you know, that's, that's a broad church. Let's have that debate. But let's not make up the sort of scams we've heard about earlier in the day. Yeah? Let's not just trash the reputation, marginalize the good people, because what happens is silently they leave the party and silently their role as citizens, the field on civic engagement shrinks. And that's bad for democracy. It's not just bad for the Labour Party. It's not just bad for socialism. It's bad for the society. We've got to stop it. And we need good people engaging in that struggle throughout the period, not just handing out leaflets and taking selfies and saying hashtag Labour doorstep. No. Thank you. Thanks, sister. Before I then uh, I ask the uh, audience if they've got any questions, I just wanted to just put one to uh, to uh, to Roger in relation to picking up really on a little bit of what uh, Greg has talked about there. And one of the things I've been quite passionate about is, and what you seem to be doing in in Newham, is is uh, raising political consciousness, but also raising expectations, so that the community starts to demand that the local authority starts to do things. But you're also like the Panthers did where there's public service failure, then encourage the community to do it for themselves, but force the powers that be to use the powers at their disposal and don't take no for an answer. So what's your thoughts on that, to Roger? Does that microphone work, by the way, rather than just sharing this one all the time? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, about, about raising expectations and raising political consciousness. Well, I think, uh, is this working? It's okay, thank oh. you. Just hold it. Okay. Um, well, I think as Corell has explained, we are reaching uh, thousands of people. I don't know if you could estimate Corell, maybe, but I mean the, the food banks, the school uniform swap shops, yeah. the uh, the campaigns on um, the environment or on pollution. Uh, I mean, all of these things mean engagement, constant engagement. The councillors, you never see them. Yeah. There's, uh, was it 60, I think, um, Newham councillors? And um, I, I don't think you could count on one hand anybody who even gives a damn about the rights and the needs of ordinary people in, in the uh, borough. So it is about that, but it's about also offering them a political vision and a political, you know, raising their horizons so it's not just about people doing things for them, but what they can do for themselves and mobilizing them. And that's, to be frank, that's something which um, we haven't, we've only just, we're at the very, very beginning of doing that. But um, that's our goal. Indeed. Well, even a journey of a thousand miles starts with a solitary step, comrade. So just remember that. Uh, anybody got any uh, comments? Could you say one in the corner there? Comrade here in the corner. Okay, um, I want to make a contribution, if that's all right. Yeah, of course, mate. I'm a Go former local government worker for 40 years, so in terms of music, municipal socialism, I think I've got an insight in, to some small degree. I want to comment first on the, uh, the video, the Preston model. Well, I'd say it's really an important issue whether you spend your resources locally with local companies and firms, etc., keeps keeps the money circulating and it, and if you're aiming to benefit the local people then i think that's a good thing because i think the opposite of that is the barnet model where they actually said we want to take all of our services or most of them out of the local area and give them to big private companies to manage and that that's the choice really but i think the missing dimension is to say it's, a, it's a, a socialist act. So that's why we're doing it. We want to build up the, uh, the local people and, and make the local community stronger and build a, a, a socialist approach. So um, I was in building, first of all, construction, and that was in the 70s. And then in the 80s, someone called Margaret Thatcher, a woman, you know, highly celebrated. We have our first woman uh, Prime Minister, so that should have been something to celebrate with some people, but it's a complete and utter disaster, as we all know, because there started the privatisation of public services. So in construction, we were the guinea pigs because we had to start tendering the, the work. We were putting up hundreds and thousands of, uh, of uh, properties for council tenants 
on secure tenancies and uh, and council rents and then we had to start tendering and and of course what the private companies do is they uh, um, they um, lost put loss leading uh, tenders in so they win the contract and then they say uh, to the council oh oh we can't actually uh, build for that so we're going to have to put these extra costs and they, and they got the council over the barrel so they end up paying much much more than what the actual tender price I, I don't need to tell you you know that whole story but it's necessary to say that and 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 um, you know councils had direct labor organizations all over the country publicly run directly employed people on decent wages and that came about because in the late 1800s in construction the private companies got together and they took it in turns but particularly in London to say well we'll let you win that tender and they set the prices and so they were ripping off the local authorities so when the Labour Party was formed they said well we've got to have an answer to that and then they started forming their own public uh, um, bodies to, to start developing their own services. We need to recount that short history so that people know that there is an alternative and what's happened since Thatcher it's been an utter disaster and I'll just use one example the the privatizing of regulatory services because when I left construction I went into environmental health I was a regulator and EHO and we tell companies what to do and if they didn't do it we had regulations and then they'd have to uh, pay for it or we take them to court and prosecute them so that's regulatory so not really that important according to Tories too much green tape do you remember that we constantly too much health and safety too much green tape well building control officers they're, they're uh, um, red tape and look what happened when they took building control officers out of local authorities. Mm -hmm. And when they privatized the building research establishment, they were supposed to ca carry out tests on building components and materials. What it, did it lead to? Grenfell and, uh, and other fires like that. So we need to keep saying it's about, we had municipal socialism and municipal uh, public provision through through Labour governments and look what we got when they take that away from us and we have to keep telling that story because basically um, I want there are lots to criticize Labour councils about and I think a key political issue is that the, um, there's too much managerialism in local authorities so in the Labour grassroots on the Sunday there's this um, Count, uh, leader of the council at Hammersmith and Fulham. Twice in the last six months, I've heard him come on there and say, oh, well, the, you know, the cuts, we shouldn't be going on about the cuts all the time because in Hammersmith and Fulham, we've been able to uh, reorganise council services and it hasn't really had a bad impact. I think, you know, can you imagine that's the message we want to put across to the people in our communities, oh, oh, you know, we can manage this a lot better. Uh, all we have to do is shuffle things around. It's, it's completely the wrong message because we have to say that the Tories are trying to decimate public provision so that working class people like you are going to suffer more and more and more. Not tell them that we can manage it, but, we're, but at the same time say we will try and uh, do whatever we can within our limits. So I'd, I'm going to point to one positive example that I read about um, Norwich Council in the last couple of years built this Goldsmith Street 100 properties the highest uh, standard of um, energy efficiency which means 70% reduction in uh, fuel costs and they're all council uh, properties and they're going to be let on secure tenancies and uh, council rents Fantastic. That should be trumpeted all across the Labour movement to show that things can be better. I don't know how Norwich managed to do it. They didn't use private developers, but that's what we should be doing. And that's a socialist initiative. And we need more of that and less of this managerialism, which is what we get from the vast majority of Labour councils. And I'll finish on a quote from uh, Tony Benn, which because uh, I used to go to see him as much as I could when it was quite clear that he, you know, he didn't have long to go. And at one of these meetings, he said, the mark of a civilized society is a balance between public and private, 
Now, I don't know, he wasn't trying to say that's socialism, just having a balance, 50% private, 50% public. But he was saying, if you take away the public realm and you don't have that cushion for ordinary working class people, it's no longer a civil, civilised society. And guess what? That's what it looks like now, doesn't it? Complete and utter chaos because there's no rules. It's to the market. And, we, and in that conference, they should be talking socialism. Of course, if it was Corbyn that was there, we'd have a lot lot more talk about socialism and we are the socialists and we need to keep promoting that message about municipal socialism yeah absolutely absolutely i mean and your point about housing is uh, is well made and, and congratulations to norwich but it shouldn't be just be 100 it should be thousands the uh, rev the housing revenue cap has been lifted there is no limit now on local authorities investing in housing that they used to be and one of the things about raising political consciousness and raising political expectations is in my opinion local authorities have it within their power now to end the housing crisis in each and every borough sometimes it's more tricky in, in london boroughs i accept that we landlocked and property prices etc and th that's about building yes and where you haven't got the skill set you employ people uh, and train them up and in the meantime, you can engage in a municipalization program. That's what local authorities used to do. And there is no nothing to prevent local authorities from doing that. Now, I know a lot of them will say, well, you know, you're then going to be subject to the right to buy potential. But any new build doesn't attract any discount for at least 15 years. And one would hope that come the revolution, which will be started in Newham, uh, that we will have uh, gained the levers of power and, uh, and will be able to abolish the, the, the right to buy with, within 15 years. But there was a comrade just there, I think, who wanted to make a comment. Then, then, then is it? I can't see. But anyway, I thought it was Tony, but it's not. But anyway, go on. Hi, comrades. Uh, no, I think the, the problem, I think, with, is with low... Yeah, Matthew Jones, uh, Glasgow Cathcart. I don't know how, how much longer. Uh, <laughs> but... The, the problem, I think, is you've got a situation, local government in this country is quite peculiar. It's not very local. Um, actually, all the money is held centrally. Um, you know, so actually what local government, the, 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 the role of local government is to take orders. So people are being shortchanged, essentially, you know, in terms of, you know, in, in effect, I mean, you can elect what councillors you like. But the budget is not set by them, it's set by whoever. I mean, in Scotland, for instance, it's set at Holyrood um, and you know, is fairly crushingly um, used against the councils, particularly Glasgow, of course, because it has the most need. Um, so, I mean, the thing is, you look at it, actually, the, 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 the whole structure is wrong. I mean, the structure of like, you know, you could, you could tear local government apart in, in, in Scotland and put it back together because it was all it was all put together as a sort of gerrymander by the major government in the in the 90s um, to keep themselves happy. Um, you can also say, you know, look, local government, unlike in most other countries, actually, doesn't doesn't raise mo hardly any of its own money. I think it's about 15 percent through the, the council tax. You've got a council tax which is put together was put together on literally almost on the back of a fag packet as an emergency replacement for the for the the poll tax. Okay. Um, you know, which is unfair, it's deeply unfair, you know, uh, uh, people, many people have proposed to abolish it, you know, I mean, it's been proposed over and over again in Scotland, we should abolish the, the council tax, abolish the council tax, you know, but nobody's actually ever done it, or even attempted to do it, or proposed anything that, that has been seriously put to, to the Parliament in Holyrood or anywhere else in terms of abolishing the, the, the council tax and, and instating some fairer kind of taxation. And these are, the, these are the issues you've got. Actually, you know, it's deeply and profoundly and, and you know, obviously deliberately anti-democratic, mm. you know. Um, and I think that, you know, if you look at it, the other thing, of course, is the, the nature, if you look at the nature of the Labour Party and local government, it's deeply corrupt. That's the only word you can use for it. I mean, you know, here, I mean, I could go through, you know, like that, uh, probably take up, you know, God knows the rest of this meeting talking about how vile the Labour Party is in terms of local government in Glasgow. You know, the sort of things they've done, the sort of things that, you know, it leads to the thing, you know, my, in my, my, the only councillors they've got left in my ward when we, when we did reselection um, five years ago uh, was uh, actually the main thing he said was it ranting against the local, the local trade unions because he hated the unions, mm -hmm. the council unions. Because they resisted what they were, what, what, what the, the Labour group were trying to do. Um, you know, you've you got the situation, obviously, as people will have heard that, the, that um, you know, the women workers in, in, in Glasgow were robbed by, by a, a scheme put it together by the, 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 the unions themselves, actually, and the councillors of in excess of half a billion quid mm. that they were, they were owed under, under, under um, equal pay, you know. 
And that, that's, the, that's the thing you've got. And at the same time, you've also got a situation where the Labour Party, of course, operates to prevent the left from standing. I mean, I think in, in, in the Labour Party this year, when because obviously the election will be, will be next year, um, and only 19 people put themselves forward to be on the panel, besides the, besides the, the existing councillors, uh, many of some of whom are resigning for various reasons, you know, because obviously, you know. But basically, what you've got is a situation in which people, are the, the 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 thing they're being offered, is to take their own city apart. Mm. Now, why why would you want to do it? What what exactly would you want to do that job for? And those people who don't want to do that are refused. Actually, there's two comrades. I think at least one of them's here, who was just told immediately by the by the by the city party, no, you can't be, you can't even stand as a councillor because we don't think you'll vote for, for, for taking your own city apart, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the way it works. And I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a profound thing. I mean, it's, you know, to the point now where we've got a situation in the city in which the, the effect of COVID is to close 60 venues, which are run by the city, because there's a big, big network. There's about sort of 170 odd venues around the city. And the thing was, of course, obviously COVID basically accentuates the whole, um, financial crisis uh, and of course it's an arm's length management operation yeah. and of course when, when you get to this crisis the point being is to say okay well you know we've run out of money we've got to close all these things of course nobody's ever voted for any of that i don't know put put to them so there's a big protest and all this sort of stuff but none no, there's nobody on the council there are four parties on the council which is the smp or the minority administration the labor party the greens and the tories and all of them agree with the cuts all of them agree. Any, any, if any of those people were in power, they would do exactly the same thing. We have the, we have the leader of the SNP, who's now the, le the, the leader of the council, comes out and says, right, OK, um, you know, we don't agree with, 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 with cleaning the city anymore. You're going to have, you as the citizens are going to clean your own city. You know, again, never been put to anybody in the election. You say, well, we just run out of money. So you've got to do it. Why, 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 why people need public services? I mean, it's, it's an absurd position. Well, and I mean, I think, absurd I, think position. I think clearly what you're you're setting out there is is a major problem with representative democracy. And if we put all our faith in just electing people, whether it be to parliament or to local authorities, and then just forget about it, it ain't going to work. And that's why building a movement is so crucial, it seems to me. And, and frankly, things can be done. Yes, the budgets are set to essentially in terms of the money handed down from central government. But there is the ability now for local authorities, which is one thing what Greg was referring to, that meeting that I first spoke at in, in Brighton, uh, for local authorities to introduce a redistributive council tax, where the rich people in the borough has to pay a lot more, and you freeze it or even reduce it for everybody else. That is possible to do now. You have to go to a referendum, but Christ, you could win that referendum, couldn't you, for goodness sake, or you should be able to, you know, if you're you know, half decent to, to a campaigner. <laughs> but, they, you know, it's an abdication of responsibility when local councils are doing what has just been set out there. And this is why it's fantastic what's happening in Newham, and hopefully that can be replicated. And there will be other examples, I'm sure, up and down the country. And I keep talking about the Festival of Resistance, because one of the things that we're very keen to do is to bring people together so we can raise political consciences, we can raise political expectations, and we can demonstrate to people and give people confidence that by coming together, we can make a difference. And hopefully new working class leaders will come through and get elected to replace the bloody dross that we've got occupying the town halls up and down the country at the moment. But there's a comrade at the back, I can't see who it is actually, but. Uh, it's not Tony, is it? No, 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 because Tony told me off because I couldn't see him the other day, didn't you? Tony's here. Oh, oh right, right. Tony's here also. <laughs> yeah, Tony, anyway, I, think, I don't know if Tony wants to speak, but, if, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's me, not Tony. <laughs> Just on a couple of things. I mean, I, I, I take the point about the, the question of what is the point of local government? I think it's a very valid one because I think if you look at what's happened over the last 40 years since I've been involved in politics, which is you know, I've been involved as a communist in various different projects and as a, in various left-wing left splits from the Labour Party as well, you know, like Arthur Scargill's going back that far, you know. Um, the question of what the, you know, the Labour Party has been enforcing cuts and uh, austerity and, uh, and all that sort of thing for the whole of that period, effectively, even before austerity became the big buzzword after the, uh, uh, the financial crisis in the late 2000s. It was doing it before that. People were being, people were being expelled from, or, or chucked out of Labour groups for not voting for cuts in the early 2000s and in the 1990s and all that period, you know. And I think that the, the overriding point about this is about Thatcher. 
it's about capitulation to Thatcher by the Labour Party, and, and the and the agenda of Thatcher was 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 twofold. It was you know, the hollowing out of local democracy, the destruction of local councils, and, and their real ability to act on, on on most things went hand in hand with the destruction of manufacturing and uh, uh, and of, of industry, the export of jobs elsewhere for lower wages, etc. It's a part of the major restructuring of capitalism, really. You know, I mean, I think in the in the uh, you know in the, in the post-war period and and probably earlier than that, there was a certain amount of room for manoeuvre for uh, re reforms to be delivered at a local level. But that, I mean, I mean it maybe that there's been a certain, you know, drift in that over the last few years, but I think that's basically still true, is that the, the centralisation of control of, uh, of councils is, is a reflection of the, of the cuts regime you know, overall, you know. And I think, therefore, I think that, you know, Corbyn actually completely flunk that you know because that that stuff about about you know the, the council should adhere to existing policies and existing guidelines and all this sort of thing that was that was a guideline that came from corbyn and mcdonald uh uh to just carry on as you were at the moment you know and don't make a fuss on a local level we'll handle anything that comes along when we get in government effectively you know i think that's totally self-defeating and there is no point in getting elected to the council uh, that you know, on a conventional basis, that you, you're just going to deliver reforms in a top-down manner, and uh, and uh, um, you know, be a good municipal reformist. I don't think that will work anymore. It's been, it's not been able to be work work for a long time. I think what you what you have to use the council for. It's a very limited sphere of, democ of, of, of democratic space. You have to use it as a quite consciously and openly as a means of mobilizing social resistance mm -hmm. to all these things. You know, it has to be a focus of, agi of, of, of agitation. Yes, you obviously you're going to try and get concessions from the government. You're going to get this concession, that concession if you if you fight for it. But that just has to be the central focus of it to actually mobilize resistance to the status quo at a local level. To to uh, to to uh, and um, you know the example of uh, uh, the Black Panthers, you yeah. know um, Fred Hampton, Bobby Seale, etc. Was that example that was given? You know, is is they were revolutionaries at least subjectively. They were not reformists. They may have been involved in in, in struggles around you know around particular. Uh, defensive gains or trying to get new ones or whatever, but in the end, they were their, their strategic aim was was was, uh, albeit in a sort of rather uh, unclarified way, it was revolution, you know, and I think that's that's really got to be discussed out and and clarified. What is the relate? Yeah, you know, is it possible to reform capitalism today? And I don't think it is. And I think we've got to we really have got to get this. Uh, sorted out there's so many ideological questions we have to discuss and we have to have room you know i, th I think we do have to have, uh, we do have to have a new party there are, it is it is the case though that there are so many sects around of a, of a few you know a few hundred or even a few dozen or whatever or even smaller in some cases you know but there are there are yeah we have to have a movement where all these things can be debated out in a comradely manner and uh, and and clarified I, well, I mean, I think I think just I, mean, yeah. I know Stan wants to come. We're going to have to come out. But I mean, I think what Newham have talked about in in, in relation to kind of mobilising at that local level mm -hmm. is uh, is some is a model that I think you know yeah. we need to yeah. Yeah. we need to embrace and and uh, and roll out mm -hmm. elsewhere because uh, mm -hmm. I think that that has got to be be the future. We can't sure. be this kind of council of of, of despair. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I just want to be perhaps if you could just wind up and then I want to bring Stan in. I want to get yeah, the uh, I want no to just get the um, the panel's uh, closing sure. remarks. Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry, I thought you, yeah, I was going to say one if, if you finish that. Okay, do, let's give it to Stan then now then, and uh, and then we'll uh, I'll ask the panel to respond. Yeah, a couple of we come over here. So, um, yeah, because I'm Hammersmith and Fulham. That's where I worked for the 17 years uh, since 2001. You know, and so I know the uh, the, the councillors there, and in fact, um, in fact, they play quite a part on the general committee of Labour. You know, when you go to the Labour general committee meeting every month. Uh, there's key people there who are councillors, so the councillors dominate, and I think that's normal, isn't it, today? That's the normal situation for Labour, you know, the councillors play a big part. Some of them are paid well. In, I know in many cases uh, around the country, I know people have been the victim of this um, bullying charge, you know, you're suddenly accused of sexism or something, and you're, you're out of membership long before the 
anti-Semitism witch hunt. You know, I, I remember reading Christine Shawcroft on the back of Labour briefing, t telling us about this normal problem that people are all, you know, the left are all disqualified until the posts are filled. And then they're let back in again and they then become ordinary Labour members. They go to conferences, as delegates and that, but they've been nobbled when election time was on or when selection of candidates was being done, you know, just for the period of, of selection. It's sufficient. And this is, when they talked about bullying the left, it's so funny. Anyway, Hammersmith and Fulham, what, what they were doing, I mean, they, they've got a Hobson's choice, you know, because... Uh, they haven't got the money. Every year we're, we're told as, as a worker there, you know, we're told, oh, the budget's cut. You've got to do, you know, show what you can do in being more efficient in delivering service with less money. A fantastic target, eh? And, uh, and that's gone on. It, the, the, taking the money away in London for all the boroughs has been terrible, you know, over a period. But what, what the, what the uh, comrade councillors are doing there, what they're not doing there, rather, despite the fact some of them are trade union reps, you know, from very stale trade unions that have left them to, to do that role as a representative, they're not mobilising the, the local people or the working class, right? They're not building a movement as they do it. So that was one side of it, I think. And that should be the difference. You know, you can, you, you can struggle. I mean, whatever you're doing, if, you, if you're actually, instead of being disqualified, right, if you're actually councillors, you actually got left Labour councillors we've got in some places, you should be doing everything with the say-so of the local party, you know, organising the membership and, and carrying the socialist discussion into the, into the meetings and so on, which, of course, we're not allowed to do at the moment, but uh, that's what you have to do, isn't it? And, um, and then um, but I wanted to go back to uh, the, the question of what is the role of uh, elections anyways? You know, um, in my Labour Party Marxist group, you know, we, we studied for a period a little while ago uh, a book that I recommend by from uh, August H. Nimtz, who's a black American professor, um, and uh, about Lenin's electoral strategy. Right, it describes the the uh, the, the role of uh, elections and parliamentary work by elected MPs in Tsarist Russia, where the parliament was. Uh, disgustingly undemocratic. This was given after the 1905 revolution as a sop. So the Tsar produced this uh, parliament that first of all had no right to do anything and it gradually gained rights, you know, but there was a series of elections during the period from 1905 through to 1917. And it was actually the electoral work and the work of the MPs that won the Bolsheviks the majority amongst the working class. Uh, so it wasn't a question of getting a majority to deliver uh, laws, right? It was a question of putting forward working class politics and winning the mass of the working class. Yeah, that's all I want to say. We need to uh, we need to rediscover that because I mean, there's some great examples, wasn't there? I mean, not that long ago. I'm certainly older through it, but anyway, I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm getting quite old now. But 60 to 30, so I'm only 32 and a half in reality. Uh, but I remember people like Ted Knight and uh, and obviously what happened to the GLC, and, and and so there was there was great examples, and I mentioned you know Clay Cross where we saw uh, uh, councillors elected community leaders if you like <clears throat> mobilizing <clears throat> mobilizing the community and being very much community champions electric community champions <clears throat> spokespeople for the community not spokespeople for the local authority but let me just go from uh, from left to to right if i may just uh, starting with uh, roger you just give your closing um, thoughts on the meeting and what you've heard yeah i think it's been a great meeting and i think we've all learned from it um, I want to just put it in uh, very, very quickly, and let's put this in a historical context. Why do we have local government? The reason is because at a time when British capitalism and British imperialism was still going forward and was still building and still had a role to play, they realised at a certain point that you need some elementary standards as far as the ordinary working people were concerned. They found, for instance, after the Napoleonic Wars, they were horrified at the, um, the, the uh, ill health and the illiteracy of uh, their soldiers. They needed an army that, could, uh, that was um, healthy enough and fit enough to fight their wars for them. It was mainly, I believe, about that. And they, um, so therefore, who was going to preside? I mean, not just that, they need, if, if workers were dying off from typhoid and cholera and all the rest of it, then uh, where was their pool of uh, useful labor? 
if they couldn't, um, if if there was not at least an, a section of them that could read and write, then uh, then there was it was very limited. They could only use, um, uh, uh, you know, almost like uh, animal labour um, from from the uneducated. They needed a more sophisticated uh, workforce and so on. They needed to provide some kind of housing so that people weren't just um, left at the mercy of the elements. They needed sewage and sanitation because, uh, because of all the um, diseases and the uh, rat infestation and all the rest of it. And therefore, who was going to provide that? Capitalism wasn't going to do it because you know, the main thing about these poor people is they've got no money. <laughs> they weren't going to be able to buy housing and uh, sanitation and education and all these things. So therefore, grudgingly, the ruling class thought, well, we have to have, you have to sort of spare a little bit of money to build up um, um, local administrations that would provide these elementary basic uh, hygiene and um, services um, for their own benefit. And then it was on that basis that councils began to develop, and then the Labour Party began, and then you began to get Labour councils, and you got um, confrontations such as um, Carell described, like um, uh, George Ransbury in Poplar, uh, the neighbouring borough to, um, to Newham. And uh, then later you got things like, well, well, Chris can tell us a lot about um, the Clay Cross Council and the amazing uh, defiance they showed to the Tory government at the time and Liverpool Council, which defied Thatcher. So, I mean, there are examples. Um, and as a result of all that, and also with the decay of British capitalism, they're now more and more privatization is their thing they think well that's enough of all that of providing public services and you know uh, we're not going to be lady bountiful anymore we're you know let let, let them uh, you know they find various ways in which they can make money uh, out of that and so at one extreme you get um as comrades referred to the barnet model which was absolutely um uh, uh, privatized everything i think they called it the easy jet council didn't they yeah and um, so I'm amazed, actually, to see the Preston film. I mean, if they can do that, that's a model and a beacon to all of us, that even in these conditions now, there, there is room for something. How long, if, if it got taken up by a number of councils, I wonder how long it'll be that, that before the... Uh, the gates will shut on those uh, opportunities too. But I think that's what we have to bear in mind. Thanks everybody for a really stimulating discussion. No, indeed. Well, I think certainly Preston model should be the, the, the minimum that local authorities should be doing. They should be going a dump site further than that and using the powers at their disposal. But Carol, do you have got any closing comments? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for your ideas. I've made notes on that. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, today by being here and listening to you all and for the people on the uh, on the platform as well alongside me. Um, I'd just like to say in relation to what Roger has said that the ruling class will practice socialism for themselves and capitalism for the rest of us and there's countless examples historically of that and we see it today as well. Um, in the East End we really face a lot of hardship and it feels sometimes like we're going back to Victorian London. Um, you know, it's really, really hard for a lot of people. And we have to, we have no choice but to mobilize. We have no choice but to fight back. Um, Fred Hampton said, you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. And that is true, but we have to fight for what we believe and we have a history of that in East London. So please watch us out on social media. If you know of other groups that would like to be in contact with us, we'd really like to build um, across London and wider because one of the things that local councils could have done, particularly in London, was when they were facing all the cuts, they should have looked outwards and sought solidarity from each other. I see no evidence of that lots of moaning about austerity and how they've lost tens of millions of pounds. That's true. But Labour councils should understand solidarity and they should have sought it from each other. And that's what we're doing at a local level. And we want to work alongside other people right across the country who want to do similar things to us. Thank you.
And uh, Greg, last word to you. It's inevitable that every local authority is a dysfunctional bureaucracy. You know, there are different levels and there's no solution to that, but that's a symptom really. And the cause is, as you'll gather, the lack of politics, the lack of democracy that lets that happen. And yes, I agree, we should resist. That's the name of this event, we should resist. But I'm fed up hearing Labour councillors saying we're better than the Tories. I mean, it's a pretty low threshold, yeah? If you're going to politics to be better than the Tories, and that'll get you elected. It will, it'll get you elected. But it's a pretty modest ambition. And therefore, what we've got to do is think beyond resistance and think about possibilities, about the new world we can help to be part of and how do we help that to come into being. And meanwhile, we have to accept that those with the broadest shoulders locally have to do whatever it takes to prevent someone becoming homeless, to prevent special needs kids not having their needs being met, to, to protect a disabled elderly person, anyone with disabilities, from having the sort of suffering that they have. Whatever it takes, that just has to be a red line, yeah? And then we really will be better than the Tories, but not only that, we'll be better than the Labour Party, we'll be better than social democracy, we'll be on that path to total transformation of society and locally and nationally about how citizens, the working class, take control of their own lives and their own future. And then councillors will have to stop talking rubbish. Well, thank you very much indeed for a stimulating meeting and I now declare our proceedings closed. Thank you.